Uh, welcome all. Um, we are going to divide the session in two. At uh, first, uh, we are going to have uh, main uh, presentations of, of our cases, and then we are we would like to open a space of uh, discussion to, uh, with our panelists. So I would like to introduce you to Harry Clemens. Harry Clemens is a pro program officer of Carbon Finance in EVOS, the Humanist Institute of uh, Development Cooperation. Harry. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> so I'll start then. Uh, maybe you can start the slides, yeah. So I will talk about, well, I will give one presentation on one of the cases about uh, the relationship between agriculture and climate change with also incorporating climate finance. Uh, that's the case of the bioslurry. Bioslurry, which is uh, uh, used as fertilizer in connection with, um, with biogas, domestic biogas. So, uh, the next, uh, the first slide, yeah, so here you can see the basic uh, design of uh, a biodigester. Uh, we have programs of uh, biogas and bioslurry in uh, uh, several countries of uh, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And uh, the basic, it's uh, uh, at a household level, so these are uh, small digesters. Uh, the basic design is a fixed dome. Uh, design of uh, yeah in between four cubic and 13 cubic meter and so you can see on the picture that on the left side there's the the, <coughs> the wet uh, organic waste that's uh, the inflow so uh, usually it's uh, livestock manure and uh, also human excreta uh, so you need to put the uh, the, the manure uh, at the le uh, left side it flows into the digester uh, there it, there's the process of the digesting, so after, uh, uh, m yeah, after some 20 to 30 days it starts producing the gas, uh, the gas goes up and uh, by the gas pressure, uh, the, the, the digester slurry uh, gets under pressure and will be put out to the right, so that the effluent, that is the bio slurry, that will automatically uh, go out and that's the, the fertilizer that we will be talking about. So the uh, design is uh, that we manage uh, usually in the HIFOS and SNV programs. It's the fixed dome design, so it's underground. You have other models, but this is a model that is uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite solid. So it has uh, usually a lifetime of uh, 20 years uh, or longer. Uh, so, but uh, the investment cost is not so low, uh, it, uh, but and, and it varies between uh, countries. In general, uh, Asia is uh, much cheaper than Africa and also than Latin America. No? So the construction cost would be in between uh, 350 and 800 dollars in Asia, and uh, between uh, 600 and 1,000 dollars in uh, Africa and uh, also in Latin America. So it has basically uh, two uh, products, no? the biogas uh, for cooking and lighting and also the biosolary as organic uh, fertilizer. So the next slide, please. Yeah, so here you can see uh, the, 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 well, the two products are the, the biogas and the, uh, and the biosolary, but uh, there are multiple benefits. So uh, it, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the programs, they create uh, uh, local employment no, uh, the, the, the gas, which is a, a clean cooking uh, uh, fuel, uh, so it uh, has, uh, uh, yeah, the cooking which is convenient, fast, uh, healthy. And there's also the lighting uh, option, or, uh, well, better to say the, 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 the uh, aggregate for those households that uh, don't have uh, electricity. The lighting is also uh, a nice uh, benefit. And then there's the fertilizer. So, next slide, please. So, uh, the bio slurry, uh, there is, uh, <coughs> yeah, as I mentioned, the supreme uh, fertilizer. It can be applied in three different forms. Now, it can be dr uh, applied directly in a liquid form uh, that has, uh, yeah, the, the, the digester slurry uh, is beneficial because it's uh, readily available, the nutrients. Uh, 
So the liquid form uh, can, can be absorbed by the, and used by the plant uh, directly. Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, yeah, it's uh, heavy and it's not uh, so convenient to to transport. So when uh, when the farmer uses it, uh, it uh, for longer distances, they uh, often dry it, uh, and uh, then the third alternative is to compost it. Uh, and that would be the best uh, form, but well, that depends on the needs. You know? uh, so, <coughs> uh, for uh, the, the most common or the most uh, popular model is six cubic meter, and that is uh, yeah sufficient for uh, one uh, fertilizing one hectare on average. And if you uh, compost it with organic waste, you can. Uh, yeah, you can uh, use uh, product, you have fertilizer for about uh, three hectares. Of course, all is variable, it's, it depends on the crop and the specific needs. <coughs> and that uh, also is uh, for the, uh, for the uh, revenues and the uh, yield increases. So actually we have uh, 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 made a document with all the, uh, yeah, the different uh, results in, in practice, how uh, yields are increasing in different crops, so I brought some uh, uh, copies of that, and that will be at the SNV uh, booth uh, here in the in uh, yeah in in, the, in the one of those booths. <coughs> so there you can see in more detail uh, the benefits of the slurry, but on average it's 25% uh, crop revenue increase compared to uh, uh, the, the the raw manure. So next slide, please. Okay, so uh, those programs that uh, we uh, have uh, are uh, uh, in, 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 as I said, in Africa and Asia and uh, Latin America. Well, uh, in uh, Africa, there's the African Biogas Partnership Program that's in five countries. We have uh, <coughs> in, in Indonesia and uh, Cambodia. So now, uh, we have uh, carbon projects uh, uh, registered for biogas in four countries and in validation for the other countries. Uh, we will focus now on the Kenya and, 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 and Indonesia because that's where we are working also on the bioslurry uh, part. Uh, on the energy part, uh, hence it is uh, uh, already registered in Kenya and uh, Indonesia. Kenya case uh, by the CDM as a renewable energy uh, uh, project. Uh, so there, what you uh, quantify is the uh, f uh, yeah the replacement of uh, of firewood. No, and uh, also, uh, but that's more in Indonesia and in Cambodia. There's also the manure management because there's no methane uh, emissions uh, in the raw manure. So uh, Indonesia domestic biogas project is uh, registered in the voluntary gold standard. Uh, in 2013, and uh, on average, we are all variable, but on average, uh, it's four ton CO2 per household. So there's four carbon credits per household. Uh, per, uh, and that's for the energy part. So that is the part that uh, is fitting into the the, the current uh, called standard uh, and, and CDM uh, method, uh, approved methodologies. But uh, it does not uh, recognize the part for the bio slurry. So now uh, we are working with the cold standard as the cold standard launched. Uh, maybe you have seen it uh, launched uh, this week, the, the cold standard agriculture standard. It was uh, on uh, last Wednesday. And uh, so now uh, we can work on the methodologies uh, to be approved to uh, yeah, to, to quantify the, 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 the impact uh, on carbon sequestration and fertilizer replacement by the, by the bio slurry. And we are working on that. It uh, yeah, de depends on uh, where you use it, many different crops, uh, and, and how you use it in the liquid form or in the dried form or in the composted form. So that uh, makes uh, yeah, different uh, uh, situations. Uh, yeah, maybe the next slide then. Yeah, okay, so do we uh, have, uh, we are working there for, uh, with the soil and more. Now that's a specialized uh, uh, um, uh, company. 
so they have produced a methodology uh, white paper, so an initial uh, methodology for the for the yeah the, the measurement of the carbon impact of bioslurry. We have done bioslurry user surveys in Kenya and, uh, and Indonesia, and we have now uh, also the feasibility study for Indonesia uh, based on that user surveys. So we have uh, made a baseline uh, scenario project, basic scenario project plus scenario. And that's uh, basically because it's uh, so uh, different uh, in the different types of applications. So most people now use it uh, in the liquid or dried uh, form and only a small percentage uh, uh, in the composted form. Uh, and so the, cal the initial calculations is that with the project basic scenario, uh, with that mix of uh, applications, it's 2.4 ton uh, per hectare. But if, we, uh, if uh, up to 70% of the users would uh, make uh, compost it, then it would go up to 5.3 ton per hectare. And then, uh, well, uh, on average, the farmers, uh, they uh, have uh, 0 0.6 uh, hectares, uh, uh, those uh, that are in the, in the survey. So that's uh, more or less the, 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 ca the case description. There's uh, still one more slide. Okay, yeah, so uh, it's a kind of a landscape plus, uh, uh, I would say, because uh, it has uh, the biogas and bioslurry in combination. It really has uh, all three elements of the landscape, the reduced deforestation now because of the substitute, the replacement of, uh, of the firewood. Uh, it has the improved agriculture, uh, and it is also, uh, yeah, uh, uh, re reinforcing the, the integrated livestock and crops uh, system, and it has the energy system. Uh, so, uh, and uh, besides that, it also uh, is, uh, let's say, the plus because it's uh, about livelihoods, it's about fo food security. Uh, there's a, a very strong uh, health benefit. There's the time savings because, uh, and especially important for the women. Uh, uh, because uh, they in many places are who uh, collect uh, the wood. And there's the income generation both by the users and by the constructors. So maybe, yeah, I've not mentioned uh, yet that it's a market-based approach. We train uh, uh, construct uh, masons, uh, they form uh, small enterprises, and so there's also the local employment uh, uh, economy uh, part. So that's, uh, yeah, let's say landscapes. Plus. Thank you. I kindly ask you all to, to maintain your questions to, to, to the end. And I want to uh, introduce now to Francisco Fonseca, a senior researcher and advisor of SEDECO. Um, yes, it works. Well, um, I work for SEDECO, which is an NGO based in Costa Rica. We work in some other countries in Latin America. SEDECO is an NGO that has worked for about 30 years in sustainable agriculture. And we also have developed a methodology named Cambio 2, which is uh, proper for measuring carbon sequestration from sustainable practice uh, in sustainable farming. Uh, the, I'm going to present you some of the results we already have after somehow like one and a half years working together with the gold standard. This is one of the six <coughs> projects selected to implement agricultural methodologies that may be used for the new standard of the gold standard. This whole process is being sponsored by Hebos from, from the Netherlands. Next one. So Pascafen is the name of the, of the project. Uh, it stands for Sustainable Agriculture in Coffee Plantation in Nicaragua, in Spanish, of course. We are working with a quite important uh, organization, a cooperative, second level cooperative named Porado de Coop. This, it, this cooperative covers around 38 different coops. And we picked three, uh, two cooperatives from two different departments in, in the northern part of Nicaragua, where they are placed, where most of the high quality coffee comes from Nicaragua. Uh, one cooperative was conventional plus for trade, 
under the cooperative implement organic practice certified as well, plus fair trade. From them, we picked 45 farms to implement the Cambidos methodology in the field. One, some key aspects to bear in mind from these cooperatives are that they are uh, agro-system, agroforestry systems. That means that they have already established for uh, trees into the coffee plantations for shading. And another aspect to bear in mind, important, is that they apply almost nothing, uh, very low to nothing fertilizer, so they have very low yields. And because of the undernourished uh, condition of the plants, uh, they are affected severely, severely for uh, the coffee leaf rust and other diseases. So that's something that we want to tackle. Next one, please. So, um, in an eventual project with uh, carbon credits uh, certified by the gold standard, we would expect to be these carbon credits to be invested in a, a composting facility to improve uh, yields and to have a better way to manage the, the, the sanitary aspects of the plants. And we already said that there are uh, aerial uh, trees in the, in the systems, so the carbon will come from the aerial biomass that they said the leaves and, and parts of the trees that comes to, uh, falls to the, into the ground and add to, uh, carbon to, it, to the soil. And soil carbon, biomass, and avoided emissions that come from the substitution from chemical fertilizers and now using compost or organic fertilizers. So in a 20 years period, this credit will be added from the trees and from adding uh, applying composting in the field that will add carbon to the soil and will avoid emissions to the, to the, to the air, to atmosphere. Next one. So this is one projection we have made. Uh, it's a model with Brotsy model. We have done this projection uh, calculating uh, to satisfy the 60% of nitrogen for the coffee plants for them to increase yields. That is something that they cannot achieve currently. And so this is the forecast, uh, an example of the forecast accumulation rate per year, per hectare, in 20 years that will be used for, uh, for the carbon credits estimation in the future. Uh, the next one. Here we have uh, two variables. Is one is yields, expected yields, and emissions. So. We have organic on the top and bottom uh, on the bottom con conventional farmers. On the top, we see with the uh, purple uh, bars, uh, there's the situation where there is no project. So in the organic farms, yields will remain about the same. You can see in the red line that emissions will be about the same, emissions of greenhouse gases. But having the project, we may expect these yields to increase by year six to almost double, but we can see in the blue line that emissions will go up as well. I'm going to that later in another slide. For conventional farmers, the expectations will be that um, we can see again in the um, purple bars, they will have more similar uh, yields. Uh, it depends on coffee price and the cost of uh, fertilizers. But we can see that there will be um, parallel to increments of the carbon emissions due to the chemical fertilizers. Uh, with the project, we would expect the day to increase quite a lot the, 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 the yield. We can see in the, in the green bars. But we see in the blue line that the emissions will be reduced because of the substitution of chemical fertilizers with compost. Next one, please. So what I say about the emissions from the compost uh, application. So we have estimated that uh, the compost will cause emissions, but they will also add carbon into the soil. 
And in the organic farming systems, uh, the accumulation of uh, carbon will be six times higher than the emissions caused because of the composting. So there, we don't need to worry about that. It's about the same case in the conventional one. The next one, please. Next one, please. OK, uh, as I said before, they have agroforestry systems where there are banana crops and um, trees uh, that are useful also for the bees. They produce honey, so it's important. And there are the trees uh, uh, covering the, 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 um, the coffee plants. And the expectation is to, in a, a capture rate for CO2, as it said, in conventional 2.33, and in the organic, a little bit lower because they have more trees in the conventional ones. So this is important to, um, to bear in mind because of the next slide, please. Next. Next one. Yeah. So one of the importance of this uh, project is that um, because of the coffee leaf rust, especially the conventional farmers are tempted to switch from the bars that they already have uh, to more resistant varieties to the coffee leaf rust. And the problem is that these, uh, there are two problems with this. The co these, um, these plants need more light, so they will cut the trees that are already there. And this coffee, the quality of this coffee is not that good. And the problem is that this organization, Prodecop, is well positioned in the market because of the quality of the, of the coffee. So they will lose market, and they won't get the fair trade price they already have. Next one, please. So this is what we expect to happen uh, with the project. It's another representation. We already have a, a measured the baseline. Uh, we have already uh, measured what is the increase in carbon sequestration because the shift from conventional systems including uh, organic farming. But by implementing a composting facility, we would expect this uh, carbon rate sequestration to speed up, to be boost. And then this is what would be the additionality of the project that would be uh, offered in the market, and the carbon markets. Next one, please. So again, uh, the composting facility will go to the coffee plantations. We expect this to increase yields and to increase also carbon in soil. And we get for the carbon credits that will be used for uh, paying back the investment in the composting facility. Next one, please. <coughs> Sorry. Some of the benefits. <coughs> Sorry. Are um, to increase the yields to have a better control of the diseases, especially the coffee leaf rust. <coughs> and um, there's something we already have found that by using organic uh, fertilizer to improve the, the, the nutrition of the plant, we, better, we get better uh, taste, we better uh, higher um, qualification of the, of, the, of the coffee. They have a better taste so they can claim for a higher price. And we have seen also, we have measured, for example, from reduction from 20 to 5% reductions in the, in the defective uh, coffee beans. So this is very important for them in terms of the yields and the quantities they can sell into the quality markets. Next one, please. So we expect from this project to increase the income from having higher yields to improve the quality of the coffee, to reduce the losses because of the coffee beans, and of course, because reducing also the losses due to the diseases, uh, to improve the livelihoods. And we, belong, we believe that a stronger farmer organizations is a key, a key issue in order to promote uh, the creation of farming and no farming uh, jobs in, in, the, in the communities to demand services and to promote the, the, a more dynamic economy in their, in their own uh, landscapes. Next one. 
So thanks for your attention, and I hope your questions later. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Now uh, I want to introduce you to Roberto Ugas. Roberto Ugas is a member of the board of IFOAM, but it, it, he is also a, a research a researcher in the University La Molina here in, in Peru. Roberto, your the floor is yours. Pueden poner la presentación, por favor. No, es un PDF. Good morning. Encontraron. I will report about a household survey that we conducted a few months ago in the Peruvian Andes. And we try to understand the relationship between agroecology, livelihoods, and food security. This was part of a, a research project funded by Canadian development agencies in which uh, we had uh, collaboration with Peruvian and Canadian organizations and our main partner in the field was the National Association of Ecological Farmers. When we speak of uh, ecological farmers in the context of this uh, report, we don't mean third-party certified farmers, but non-certified organic farmers, and they are involved in other uh, types of guarantee systems for organic farming, like participatory guarantee systems. The fact is that in spite of the very strong economic growth of the last two decades in Peru, the situation in the Peruvian Andes remains more or less similar, and the differences between urban and rural population remains more or less the same. This is the map, uh, the official Peruvian map of the vulnerability to food insecurity, and as you can see, the red color are the districts with the highest vulnerability to food insecurity. It follows almost exactly the Andean highlands. To the east, you have the Amazon, to the west you have the coast where almost 70% of the population lives. So in spite of uh, this economic growth and all the public discourse about the importance of uh, traditional cultures, indigenous people and biodiversity, the fact is that uh, when it comes to poverty and food insecurity, particularly in the high end, is the situation is more or less the same. So we, I cannot read, I'm sorry, I have to turn around. What we wanted was to characterize small landholders according to their agroecological practices, to analyze the relationship between rural livelihoods with emphasis on natural, financial, physical, human, and social capitals and agroecological practices, and to explain food security as an effect of agroecological practices and selected indicators of rural livelihoods. So we developed the research First of all, trying to understand the context in terms of social demographics, environmental profile, and agroecological production. We under, try to understand, and through a household survey, we made several questions about natural, physical, financial, and human and social capitals. And in the end, we try to uh, analyze it, the effects on food security. We divided the population in two main groups, agroecological farmers, where at least 70% uh, of the farms were under agroecological practice. Uh, they had not used chemical inputs for the last three years, and they were implemented at least one of the following, uh, one practice in each of the following category, using organic manures, soil and water conservation, crop diversification, and ecological pest control. On the other hand, the conventional farmers were living in the same communities as the research group or the agroecological group uh, with similar characteristics, have not been exposed to the agroecological perspective or does not know or did not know about them, and uh, implemented conventional practices at least one of the following, using chemical fertilizers, chemical insecticide, fungicide, or plant growth or moans. So we, I'm sorry, this is, this is the size of the sample that we implemented. We worked in three regions, the Northern Andes, Cajamarca, uh, the Central Andes, Huanuco, and the Southern part of the Andes, Cusco. And the total number of farmers were 221 agroecological, 230 conventional, with a total sample of 451 
uh, households. This is the first time that this type of comparison is done in Peru, and what we wanted to gather, of course, concrete facts about the effect of the agroecological implementation besides the ideological discourse. And this is the type of farmers uh, we got information from. They could have been, like in the left, a uh, very small tomato grower in the northern Andes, then a, a woman growing vegetables for the local markets in Cusco under plastic tunnels, or very traditional farmers growing native potatoes above 4,000 meters sea level. What all of them have in common is that they practice agroecology and they belong to the National Association of Ecological Farmers or were linked to such organizations. The results were very different. And when it comes to the social demographic profile, um, we found statistical differences, for example, by the, in the educational level achieved by the mother. Um, and in general, there was a high statistical significant differences uh, and the agroecological households tended to speak more Spanish than the conventional farmers. This has something to do, of course, with their access to the formal educational systems, which is basically all uh, done in Spanish. When it comes to the farming system profile, 99, almost 100% of the agro agroecological households uh, could distinguish an agroecological practice with only one-third in the conventional. Uh, almost 80% of the conventional households did not have any external support compared to only 54% in the agroecological households. Um, the agroecological households used more external labor, 61, compared to 40%. Uh, and they were also highly more interested in growing new crops and diversifying their uh, production. Uh, the sources of seeds was statistically significant uh, with significant differences uh, produced by themselves or exchanged with other farmers with comparison to the conventional which were more reliant on the modern market. When it comes to the agroecological practices, the use of organic manure, soil and water conservation and crop diversification, we asked what was the situation five years ago and what was the situation today. As you can see, the agroecological farmers five years ago, 80% uh, implemented these agroecological practices and five years later, this climbed up to almost 100% while in the conventional group, it changed from 42 from 50 to 57 in five years. So not a large increase over there. When it comes, uh, sorry. When it comes to, the, to soil and uh, water management practices five years ago, in the agroecological group, there was an increase from 75 to 99% in five years, while in the conventional group, it remained more or less the same. With, with regards to the cropping diversification systems in the agroecological group, the increase was similar from 82 to almost 100, while in the conventional group it moved from 50 to 67. When we characterized uh, natural capital, there were very interesting differences there. The conventional group uh, with significant differences expressed that their, their soils were exhausted. Uh, and also, in 40% of the cases, that the erosion has increased. The agroecological uh, households practiced pressurized irrigation systems uh, three times more than the conventional. Uh, they have planted trees, you see, 85% versus 65% in the conventional. And they consider that water to be contaminant-free, 75 versus 60%. When it comes to financial capitals, the agroecological had a clear, uh, stronger uh, connection with markets and to um, credit sources. So they usually were selling their products in the local farmers market, municipal markets, while in the conventional, there were other types of market connections. And uh, which is very important the, in these years in Peru, the percentage of families participating in government social programs was higher in the agroecological group as compared to the conventional, and there were also significant differences in access to credit. When it comes to physical capital, there were significant differences. Sorry? One minute? Okay, I will run a little. There were not many 
important differences when it comes to physical capital. When it comes to the perception uh, of family income, you can see in the top, uh, the agroecological uh, showed, uh, responded that their income has barely improved or has improved substantially, while the conventional mentioned that the, their income remained the same. With regard to social capital, there were, of course, enormous differences, basically because most of the agroecological farmers belong to farmers' uh, association. And when uh, required to answer why they belong to this organization, 66% mentioned to access new markets. When we coincide with the start of the growing season, when food reserves have already been finished, and there was some difference there between agroecological and conventional. So our preliminary conclusions are that uh, we had a solid sampling uh, allowing the detection of differences between agroecological and conventional. However, this is the first study of its kind. Agroecological households showed a better performance in the five dimensions of food security. There are normally four dimensions of food security, but we have uh, really found that institutions should be added at one of, uh, as one of the dimensions. With regards to natural and social capital, there were clear differences, not so much with human and physical. Women had a higher participation. And, it, and this is relevant for what we are discussing today, that very often agroecological households tend to be located in similar, similar micro watersheds and are organized, increasing the relevance of key indicators related to climate change where they performed better. There are many other conclusions that we are deriving right now, but one very important is the, in general, the institutional context in which these households operate is weak or very weak. And there is a really strong need for a stronger government presence of good quality. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Roberto. We have one to two minutes to clarification questions. If there's some in the audience. No? Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Harry, Francisco, and Roberto. Ah, uh, yeah. You have one. Uh, could you please uh, come in front and. Muchas gracias. Luz María Gallo del Centro Ideas. Mi pregunta es para el representante de IVOS en lo relacionado a los biodigestores y, y toda la posibilidad para poder reciclar la materia orgánica. La pregunta que tengo es el proyecto que ustedes implementaron, la dimensión, el volumen y si hubieron inversiones públicas y se convirtieron en políticas para, para los espacios, porque en nuestro país tenemos la gran limitación de cómo este, disminuir las emisiones con el tema de las basuras y los residuos sólidos. Entonces, esto como posibilidad para poder masificarlo. Gracias. Uh, ok, ya yeah, so, uh, our uh, current system is, uh, our current programs are with the uh, small holders in the rural areas. So they, these uh, household bi biogas digesters, they are based on uh, using the, uh, the, the, the manure from the cows, the cow dung mainly, or sometimes the pigs. Pig, uh, it uh, perfectly, you can mix it with uh, other uh, inputs, uh, organic uh, waste, but uh, in general we do not recommend it because then there's a risk that people uh, don't know how, how, which are the materials that could be uh, damaging the process, and yeah, so the uh, the, the the program is just based on the the, the, the cow dung, the uh, the pig dung, and human excreta uh, for the first uh, phase. No, so in future, when people are more uh, uh, accustomed to the to the system, we might uh, change that. Uh, 
But and and of course, yeah, in 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 in, in uh, for the waste uh, management, it's uh, also uh, in also in urban areas very uh, beneficial. But we focus for the moment on the on the rural areas. And I think there was another part in your question, but I don't remember. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, I want to hold your questions because we want to move to the panel. Oh, but, uh, um, and, and I want to introduce the panel, uh, and then we can interact within the panel. No? Uh, I said at the beginning that we will divide this session in two. We already have seen three excellent cases in Africa, Kenya, and Indonesia, presented by Harry, uh, also Nicaragua, presented by Francisco, and Peru, presented by Roberto. And, and now we want to also uh, welcome uh, to the floor, uh, Peter Van Miedewald. Uh, he is Director of Business Development and Land Use uh, of the Gold Standard Foundation. Uh, Christian Daneker, um, he is Director of Land Use and Carbon of South Pole. Uh, Sergio Celaya, he is a Special Advisor of Global Issues as in uh, UNCCD. Uh, Richie Huye, he is uh, Regional Director of Asia for the Environmental Defense Fund. And, uh, well, I, I didn't introduce myself. I'm from Paulo Solis, I'm Program Officer of EFOS, also for the regional, um, uh, for the region of the Andes. Um, so th this panel, uh, we want to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, and we want to start with innovation. Uh, I will show uh, the first question, and then we can continue from, from that point. And um, maybe, Harry, you can explain, well, you have already explained the scale, but um, could you or someone in, in the table can say something about what is innovative of these approaches? And, and then we come to your question. Oh, so, <coughs> yeah, well, one thing is the innovative, uh, and the, and the scale, yeah, so it's really, uh, as such, biogas systems already have existed for a long time, but uh, the programs, they bring in a market-based approach where uh, people get uh, access, uh, um, so we work on the demand side, we work with the, uh, with the uh, MFIs and uh, also on the supply side with the local uh, masons, the constructors, and um, yeah, that's uh, that's the system. Uh, so it's uh, and it's uh, the scale. Uh, I, well, I don't know if that was in, uh, part of the uh, of the of the of the question. But uh, we are in Indonesia. We have now uh, 13,000. Households uh, with biogas digesters, and in Kenya there are 12,000. Okay. Do you have a question? Okay. Yeah. Could you? Yeah, maybe you can repeat the question because I yeah, don't know. Yeah. It is to the expert from Peru. I'm uh, Shailat from National Council for Sustainable Development, India. We have exhibition upstairs. My question is to the expert from Peru that uh, analysis which you showed about agroecological practices, whether it is pure organic farming or it is organic farming or organic manure mixed with chemical fertilizer because we have found, in our experience, near. Okay. Uh, we have found in our experience with large number of farmers, small farmers, if you directly take up only organic farming, it's not viable because if it is not based on soil health analysis, right? So if you just put organic and soil health analysis requires different nutrients, then your farming is not viable. So I just want to find out from the expert from Peru what was their situation. 
And if I can add something, uh, maybe you can address a little bit of what innovative approaches uh, you, ha you have seen in, in the experience in, in Peru. We made a, a clear uh, sampling, and the difference was uh, put from the beginning. The agroecological group, about 250 farmers, were, using, were implementing different agroecological practices and have not used any chemical input for the last three years. On the other hand, the conventional farmers were practicing agriculture in a similar agroecosystem, but were using at least one chemical inputs. And our results show, and the practice shows in Peru, that there is a very high viability for ecological farmers in certain conditions. This is specifically related to the high Andes. Yeah. And what is uh, innovative about this approach, I think the uh, strongest innovation, Juan Pablo, in what I reported, was the close interaction between farmers' organizations, sometimes powerful farmers' organizations, and development agencies, May, many times local NGOs or, or other groups, even groups of restaurants teaming together to buy produce from them. So I would say uh, the most uh, relevant innovation in this context belongs to social capital. Yeah. Thanks, you, Roberto. And did this brings me to the next question, to Francisco. What is the role of other players? Uh, you present a case on coffee. Uh, what is the role of private sector in, in that? Well, actually, can you listen? Yeah, OK. Um, actually, one of the approaches we are pursuing is to convince uh, roasters, buyers of coffee, for them to understand what is the problem behind uh, low productivity and high risk for climate change of these uh, coffee farmers. Uh, so we believe they can play a great role by contributing in, in, in these investments, initial investments for scaling up these kind of alternatives for the farmers to increase yields and to become more uh, better adapted to the climate change to manage better their, um, the diseases and to also, we also pursue the investments goes to diversification of the system so they can not only depend on, on, on coffee, so they can also get income from other uh, sources. So I believe uh, these players need this increase in, in yields they need the farmers to be in the field producing because it's their own business. They need to continue the, their own business. So actually it's a win-win relationship they would expect by uh, supporting these kind of activities. And of course the financial institutions uh, together with the private sector may join and support the, these initiatives and, uh, to become more uh, resilient to the climate change. Thanks, Francisco. Uh, Peter, uh, a question for you. Uh, do you see enough room for, for this type of innovation in, in your sector, in the carbon sector? <laughs> okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, the, uh, the, I think that we're talking actually about a lot of different things here. Um, we're talking about uh, certification. We're talking about uh, organic agriculture practices. We're talking about carbon markets. Um, what uh, Francisco presented is actually a case how you can increase the production of farming systems and also find solutions to fight things like coffee rust. Um, one of the, say, proxies that he gets out of there is, is the mitigation potential that is related to it, which is, I would say, great news that, 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 that you com can combine these things. There might be other situations where the mitigation potential is not so large, but where you still uh, can achieve this increase in production um, with, uh, with adapting new practices, so better composting or increasing, increasing your soil uh, fertility. I was just getting a figure that in 2013, uh, 24 billion tons of, um, of soil has been lost again. And a lot of these initiatives actually look at how can we recover these soils and make them more productive again. If carbon markets can help with that, um, I think that is, that's great. We need any kind of finance that helps with that. Um, whether this 
finance will maybe rather come to low carbon supply chains. That is actually a concept in which I believe more, uh, where we see a, we will see a lot of movement yeah, as yes, uh, the, the, the coffee roasters and the coffee supply chains themselves have an interest in still being in business in, in 10 or 20 years from now. So you see in this sector an ever increasing willingness to invest in supply chains and increase the production sustainably at source. Um, when it, when it really comes to the carbon component, I think there should be some concerns expressed as well. Um, the uh, negotiations uh, uh, during the week and also next week and next year in, in Paris um, are, making, are making process. I think there's a lot of new thinking uh, going on and, and a more decentralization of um, contributions. But also the question is going to be who is going to pay for all these uh, actions that we want to see on the ground. And we're always talking about leveraging private capital, um, but in fact there's not too much private capital in the rooms here and not in the negotiation rooms either. So these are examples where it, it can actually work and where I think the certification, for example, also leads to other side effects than, than, than just this effect. Um, but I do have a concern more about, about the financing part of, say, the overall green transition. But we'll definitely talk about that more here. Yeah, and, and I definitely think that uh, finance requires uh, uh, innovative uh, mechanisms on, on incentives. Uh, maybe, Richie, you can uh, give us a little bit of background about market innovations that you have seen in the, in the field that can bring this to a scale, uh, for instance, ICTs. Can you all hear me? Oh, great. So my name is Richie Ahuja with the uh, Environmental Defense Fund and uh, terrific presentations from uh, Harry, Francisco and Roberto. And we are doing something similar on the ground in India. And so I'm going to draw upon that well of experience as well, where we are working with about 70, 80,000 households for biogas units, about 100,000 households for cook stoves and 20, 30,000 farmers. Uh, it is a landscape approach and I'm, I'm loving the fact that everybody here is talking about landscape approaches. <laughs> And uh, one thing I would caution on is sort of on the finance piece is that don't do this for the carbon finance. What you do this for is because it makes economic sense for the farmer. So it has to start from that place. And if it so happens that in the process, because we're doing all the things right, you're going to get some benefits, which are carbon benefits, it is then up to the aggregator or the government in play or whoever to figure out if you want to monetize that asset. And if you see value in monetizing that asset to drive or catalyze more transformation on the ground. So the jury is still out, but it is certainly, I'm glad that more and more people are exploring this avenue. Uh, it's not a done deal yet. Uh, there's also some issues around permanence, so we need to think through on that as well. But uh, I think the rigor that needs to be done. This, I think we need more and more rigor, more and more data points to show that what's being done is real, that the development effects are really what we say they are, that transaction costs are manageable. On finance, there's various sources of finance. Uh, we have leveraged some monies from, you know, there's ODA and philanthropic funds to build institutional capacity to test things out. But uh, there's huge amounts of money that governments, like my government in India, for example, spends on development. That's their business. They spend on agriculture. So there's budgetary line items. We should think about how they can be leveraged and used better and made more efficient. Uh, there's money from uh, credit agencies where a lot of the small farmers don't have credit. So can we figure out ways to get debt to them, which is low cost debt? There's social impact investments. And then there's also the whole carbon deal. So the idea is to figure out ways to blend all this together and come up with a solution that works for that particular place and context. Coffee farmers sent are into cash crops, so they may perhaps have more availability in terms of credit, credit worthiness, and if they have tenure on the land, etc. Whereas you're talking about a small-scale farmer in upland or dryland agriculture in central India, tenure issues are there a little bit. There's issues around credit worthiness uh, and availability of banking, etc. But all this is changing. So there's places you talk about ICT. Uh, you know, phone banking is coming into play in Africa. Phone banking is happening in India now, just right off the phone, phone systems. Credit is being made more available to the farmers. Uh, GIS systems are being brought into play to ensure that farm ownership is clearly defined. And all this is very, very exciting because it's going to open up the space for the farmer to, again, access the funds that the farmer needs to optimize land use. And also, all this 
information system is going to be very valuable for the farmer in the end also to take the right decisions. In the end, where I come from on all this is that the farmer is really the best optimizer of resources on the ground. They're not in the business of wasting resources. But what they do best is, you know, if they have the right amount of information, they'll take the de right decisions. The challenge is getting them the information. Thank you. And uh, moving from innovation to livelihoods, uh, resilient livelihoods, Christian, maybe you can explain us how, how these approaches is from the landscape uh, perspective builds on uh, resilient livelihoods. I'll project. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the question. And actually, um, we did start a while ago what Richie said you shouldn't do, which is looking a lot at carbon finance. <laughs> and um, we collected some experience on that in a in a organic farm in a organic farming uh, focused project. Um, and we draw some lessons from that. Um, basically, the project was not only organic farming itself, but it was an intervention to save forests. It's a RDD intervention in the end. Um, so what was done is basically um, the upscaling of conservation and organic farming and mason millet production um, through activities such as composting, um, precision planting, anti-erosion terracing and so on. But we framed that also with additional activities fairly soon um, which were um, around enabling conditions to, to, to allow that ha to happen. For example, fire management. There was a lot of wildfires that spread from other farms or from poaching activities into the fields, which then burned the biomass that you needed for the organic farming. Um, we also needed to diversify um, the workload over the year. So we, we looked at honey production and we looked at uh, nutrition gardens next to the um, villages. So that created more work when there was no other work to do. Um, and we looked also into um, fertilizer producing trees such as um, um, uh, phyterbia and uh, additional food crops uh, such as uh, moringa. And finally we framed that, as I said, with a carbon methodology using the VCS and the CCBS. And so what we found is that actually the carbon finance in the end was only you needed to kickstart activities at the start and then the project is sort of rolling out itself by itself now. Of course, it's being you know supported ongoing with carbon, but um, the, the project managed to to raise 30% productivity of of, of staples output. It managed to generate $400 a prox of income per honey farmer per year, which is about triplicating the income they had before. So we saw that carbon finance was an excellent. Kickstarter, and if there would be a better carbon price, we could do a lot more because the project is at 800,000 hectares with um, several hundred thousand people, so it could be rolled out. And I hope that in the negotiations that, you know, the enabling conditions will be set for that. Um, so maybe some lessons there. One was that um, it was key to maintain the, to avoid leakage and maintain that conditionality that we know we do this for a purpose and which also includes mitigation as honestly for the local population as the second most important priority but for the finance providers the most important one and therefore it was key to make sure that there was a land use planning set for example there were boreholes that were dried up since decades partially and before rehabilitating those and starting organic farming there we looked is that in a biodiversity corridor or, or not and then we focused on those that community said and, and we looked after that are not in the middle of an area that is sensitive. Um, second point is that work generation was key. Um, you don't want to generate more outcome with less work because then people spend their time opening new areas. Um, and it facilitate, this was also a little facilitated because it's really a non-market environment. There's almost no one going to the market selling excess crops. So as long as they have the production they need and a little excess for paying school fees for kids, there's not a lot of expansion going on. And with regards to the negotiations, I mean, um, it would be nice if the 
technologies that have been presented here and then are being used in the landscape approach could receive the adequate support by either market-based mechanisms or by the Green Climate Fund or other discussions that are ongoing. It's going slow. So meanwhile, um, what a positive message is, all these projects that have been mentioned here are probably the most sexiest one that you have on the voluntary carbon market. It's, hard, it's not a big market, but meanwhile, those are those projects that probably fetch the best prices. Thanks. Thank you. I tend to talk too much, and so if you please have questions, just raise your hands. Meanwhile, I have one for the case holders. Uh, Harry, Francisco, Roberto. Basically, uh, your cases were talking about mitigation and how you can reduce the amount of carbon. Uh, but what about adaptation and food security? Well, actually, the use of the bioslurry also has uh, great benefits for the food security and the adaptation. Uh, first of all, the food security now, because it's, uh, yeah, it's used, uh, the bioslurry is uh, often used for uh, yeah, uh, growing new crops uh, nearby in the, in the, the house. Um, so there's new uh, yeah, what you call vegetables and uh, food crops uh, coming into the, the home uh, system. Uh, yeah, and, <coughs> and then uh, next to that, the, yeah, the, 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 the fertilizer, as I mentioned, it's a good fertilizer and it's because it's uh, also containing the micronutrients, it's uh, improving the soil uh, uh, condition the soil structure, so uh, that is uh, also making uh, an impact on the resilience and uh, yeah, to adapt against uh, possible negative uh, weather uh, impacts and climate impacts. So I think there's clearly an uh, adaptation benefit as well. No? Maybe you want to add more on that? Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. From we uh, one way of looking at this is uh, farmers are already uh, if, by using improving their 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 income, they will be able to buy some other uh, food that they already they cannot get because of the they have a very low income. But we are also increasing uh, our encouraging the farmers to diversify their, their production. In the case of Prodecop, they also are producing honeybee, and they are getting income from there. We have seen uh, in other cases uh, of diversification that farmers themselves were able to pay the renovation of the, plant, of the coffee plantations because other sources that they are starting recently, like uh, a small uh, um, uh, farming, uh, uh, small uh, vegetable uh, facilities are they are selling to the markets. They also uh, having uh, chicken, eggs, and uh, some small animals and some cows, and they are diversifying. Uh, in this way, they are reducing the risk, and they are getting income from other parts. So it is another contribution for the uh, food security, food insecurity they already have. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Bill Herditch from Australia. Um, thanks for the fantastic presentations of the case studies. I just had a question for the panel about um, the application of this type of innovation to broader scale landscapes. We've talked a little bit more about smallholders here, but in Australia, for example, we've got millions and millions of hectares of extensive uh, rangelands, some on the edge of deserts, and we're doing some work in the north on the application of um, technology by way of better water access for large, large areas, opportunities to increase biodiversity, cell grazing, and re reduction of wildfire. So just a general 
question to the panel about the application of organic farming or agroecological farming processes to broader scale landscapes around the world because in a way because of the climate issues and adaptation and mitigation uh, will rely a lot on big areas of land being recovered, rehabilitated and put into better food production. Uh, for giving me the opportunity to also put the, my hair in the soup of this, this issue. Uh, and um, I agree with, uh, with your, your question. This is uh, how uh, these very innovative um, examples and cases that uh, I am very grateful to be here, being here this morning and listening to these uh, very highly relevant examples at the small scale. And how large scale operations also can I can um, benefit from this issue. How can this uh, change can be driven, not only at the at the um, on the ground, but also the financial aspects? This is a challenge that we have in front of us. And if we include in this in this uh, in this soup, as I said, the uh, the negotiation process of where why we are here in in, in Lima today, the climate change conference. Um, uh, well, let me say first that I work in the other convention uh, that came out of Rio, one of the three. Rio, there were three conventions. For those of you who don't know, if you already know, I'm sorry, I have to repeat this. But the Climate Change Convention is only one of the three Rio conventions that were agreed upon in 1992. The other one is the Biodiversity Convention and the Desertification Convention. I work in the Desertification Convention. And from that angle, I can say that um, it is a challenging to, to see the common denominator of these presentations, the soil organic carbon or carbon uh, content in the soil, how is this going to be adopted and embraced by the negotiators in the, in the uh, uh, I mean, some kilometers away from here? Uh, this is not something that we can hope and that we can wish. This is something that we have to advocate and fight for. And uh, 20 years have passed by uh, discussing about uh, in the inclusion of land and soil into the negotiation of climate change, and nothing has happened. In Kyoto, in Kyoto 1997, for example, I, 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 at that time I had my hair black. Uh, we, in Kyoto, the, the Europeans, they said, you know, we want a chemically pure a green protocol. Chemically pure means, means land and forest out of the negotiation. And that was what they got. You know, they got the Kyoto Protocol the way they wanted it, uh, this energy business. And now, f in order to include the, uh, the issues of land and soils and water and uh, for a vegetation, it's going to be challenging. Um, uh, Christiana Figueres mentioned this, mon uh, this past Monday, she wants a universal agreement for Paris. Universal, the word universal includes this issue. But I don't know how, how it is going to happen if we only, uh, well, it's good that we have these this, uh, innovative cases and that we reflect and highlight the, uh, the issue of uh, soil carbon content. But we have to pass this message in events like this and individually to those negotiators. There are other issues, on, not only on mitigation. Mitigation is great and good and well, the issues of adaptation and food security. Uh, what happened to um, other indicators that are out there, like for example, the uh, land productivity dynamics, uh, net primary product, how can we use that in the, in the, within the framework of this convention or the trends in, in land cover? These are um, indicators for the resilience of, of, the, uh, of, uh, of the land. So, there are options that we out there, many research is, has been done that it can be used. And this is one side. The other side is the financial issue. It's true that, um, that there are many resources out, uh, out there at the national level in other invest, public, public and private investments. But how to jumpstart, how to drive this change, how the Green Climate Fund or the GEF or the CDM or all these other uh, financial mechanisms that they discuss here for years and years in the convention. How can this uh, be the, the seed to create this change? And I don't see the eligibility of, of um, um, projects that have 
this, this uh, soil component or land component be included. Um, um, uh, Richard, right? Uh, the, the gentleman uh, from you mentioned, sorry, uh, you mentioned about the, the methodology not being agreed by the CDM. So you have to work on, on, on this methodology to include the soil carbon content, but this is not the only case. How we can do this to actually make these uh, projects eligible for, for this carbon financing and adaptation financing? This is the challenge we have. In terms of uh, metrics also? Sure, I'll just take one minute. It's a very good question on scale, uh, love it. Uh, one, I think, want to bring up the issue of adaptation mitigation. I think it's not a question of either or. We live on a spectrum, so no matter what you do on mitigation, often you get adaptation benefits, or if you package it as adaptation, you get mitigation benefits. What's important, I think, is for us to know where we are and what those elements are, the components, how much. And in terms of scale, uh, we are having these negotiations, and, and it's great, and I think they can add value in terms of trying to drive scale. But really, scale happens at home. It happens, is driven by local interest, as in the individual farmer, and by national interest. We need to serve those. And to do that, we need to basically, these examples are great, and we need more and more of these examples that are very much data-driven, with strong metrics, that really make the economic case. You know, governments typically look at uh, money going into the sector as a cost, and we need to start looking at that as an investment. And the moment we can show very categorically that here are the returns on that investment, then you can really start getting some scales. So the more number of projects you have, the good, more data you have, you can build confidence. So that's kind of the stuff that we are beginning to see with some of our work. Uh, we're moving from project-based approaches now to try and drive change across a whole district with smallholder farmers. Uh, in Vietnam, the work we were doing in the Delta, we're trying to now replicate it and have the government suddenly woken up and they're asking some good questions. And I think in the end, the government is the big driver of scale when it comes to investments in this sector as well. Inclu you know, you need the private sector, you need other financing, but in the developing countries often, uh, the government plays a pretty decent role, especially on infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, Roberto, you want to say that? Just a, a quick answer to your question. In the organic movement, we don't pretend to have answers for yet for every farming system, every country in the world, but there are already about 70 million hectares certified organic worldwide and Australia is one of the top five countries in terms of acreage in organic land so uh, and this only is when we count third party certified in Africa Asia and Latin America there is much more that is not yet certified but the principles are applied on farm so we hope to have this increased but certainly we need to do much more research and outreach you know. Okay, let's move to finance. And uh, Peter, do, do you see, wh what do you see the role, wh where do you see the role of private investors, private capital, in, in, to, to reach this scale that we are talking about? Um, it's, it's a very important role. Uh, if sustainability was the business as usual, we wouldn't be sitting here. So um, the, the, the conventions and all the efforts and the, the case studies, they all show how it can be done or they want to kind of break through the existing systems and uh, come up with some new solutions. So we make things like the Green Climate Fund and we do case studies and we do development aid. But if we compare those sums with the finance that is yearly going to conventional agriculture, if you know, if we would ask somebody from Mars to look at how we do things here, he would be saying, what, 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 what are you doing here? This doesn't make any sense. The only way in which we can make this transition is by changing the behavior of private capital. That's, I'm totally uh, convinced of that. Um, and it seems so obvious to me as well. Fortunately, we're seeing that. So there is more and more corporates like Unilever, that are making commitments and also putting, uh, you know, they walk the talk, they, 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 they make, they work towards more sustainable practices. And there's many others doing that as well. There's movements in Europe, in the US, of people that start to appreciate again more the, say, also intrinsic values of, uh, of food and, and regionality and, and things like that. So I think there's hope, but there's a lot that needs to be done yet. Um, through certification, we, we are partly doing that. 
there is examples also uh, of Germany where a city actually paid for organic certification of farmers that surround the city. They said we pay for the certification because they knew if farmers would be organically certified in the surroundings, it will improve the quality of the drinking water in the city because they're not allowed to use uh, pesticides and chemical fertilizers anymore. There's a lot of good examples out there already. But for real change, uh, the, the, the behavior of this big lump of investments that is yearly going into agriculture, that has to change. And this is, I think, what we're all trying through institutions, through, uh, through laws and regulations, through certification. And Christian, so do you see a role of the payment for ecosystem services schemes uh, to increase the, uh, to reduce the impact on forest degradation then? Work. Yes, this time it works. I do. Thank you. I think it was one of the two big frameworks that everyone is waiting for to be set and that everyone is working on to be set. One is um, payment for ecosystem services at a global scale driven by a large scale mechanism where the rules are set and the reward is clear and then the private sector could deliver very significantly on that. And I, so therefore, an investment to get that done should be from the public sector should be in setting those rules, you know, and on the other hand, setting the reward in the end, but not crowding out the implementation, which often can be done by private players or together with the public players. And the other one, the other big framework is the deforestation free supply chains and uh, clean supply chains that we are looking at. If that compromise that has been done um, this and last year is really delivered on by lots of large companies and we had a side event in COP some days ago. People are moving and companies are moving but they're not really clear yet how they will do it to, to get to this very short-hand goal to 2020. If that is getting traction then you know all these technologies here and all these initiatives that sit on this desk will you know will get a big boost and can probably partially even forget about the ecosystem service payments because there's enough drive without them. Thank you, Christian. Um, th the reality is that uh, the carbon, official carbon markets are collapsed. Uh, so wh where are you going to sell these carbon credits? Harry? Yeah, well, many things have been mentioned by other panelists that i would like to <laughs> reinforce and that is uh, for example also that yeah don't do this for uh, carbon uh, finance uh, no it, the objective is the economic benefit of, uh, of the farmer uh, still though the carbon finance uh, can uh, help to trigger to kickstart uh, changes no and another aspect that uh, has not been mentioned is that the, the strong monitoring uh, impact. No? So interestingly is that uh, yeah, for carbon uh, credits you will need to monitor. So that also helps to, to, to focus and to improve your interventions because you have, uh, you have to really to, 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 to follow up on what you're doing. No? So uh, traditionally also in the biogas uh, there were uh, there were bad systems, uh, bad models which were distributed and the people just count uh, how many uh, models, have, uh, digesters have been distributed. Now and with the water we know, all know, uh, well it's in all the sectors it's the same. So the, the carbon finance has that uh, effect of uh, good monitoring and uh, seeing what works and what not and does not work. But uh, yeah, clearly, uh, so uh, we, we, we sell the, the carbon credits on the voluntary uh, carbon market and uh, biogas carbon credits are great and uh, relatively good price, but of course it's far from sufficient what is needed to make a, a real transition and a real impact. No? Uh, so, somehow also, uh, Peter mentioned, uh, we need to change behavior of pi private capital, maybe uh, yeah, there's also still uh, so much uh, <laughs> lacking, but uh, in the two cases we have uh, uh, so small steps uh, because in the Indonesia biogas program and bioslurry uh, there's a, a real uh, contribution from Nestle. No, and that was uh, the, so the program is in nine provinces and, the, and it performs best where Nestle is involved. No, they support the 
uh, the farmers and who, uh, who, the, who produce the, their milk. And, and in Kenya, we also have the, the cooperation with Ecom Trading, which is a, a large uh, coffee company, and it's also, uh, uh, yeah, investing in uh, improving the agricultural practices, uh, and there also the biosolary uh, is. Uh, yeah, they, 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 they are supporting with their private capital as well. No, but it's far, <laughs> far from uh, what is really on, uh, needed. Uh, and uh, I would say also that uh, yeah, carbon uh, markets and the, the, the project-based approach, it's just a, a, a small start towards uh, really uh, promoting uh, low carbon uh, uh, growth. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I know that there are a lot of questions, but we ran out of time. So I have one last question to say here to end this, this session. So here, what's, what lesson, lessons uh, can we take for the current uh, coming uh, sustainable development goals uh, discussions? Yes, thank you very much. This is uh, relevant with the, uh, hello? Yes. With the, uh, with the topic at the, this session, um, the um, how is it that uh, the, um, in the uh, sustainable development goals that are being negotiated uh, in, uh, in New York uh, from uh, December, this December to, to the next August or September next year, there are 17 goals, and out of these 17, 14 make a reference to land, soil, water, and vegetation. 14 out of the 17. So, how is this uh, global universal negotiation in New York is going to be reflected as well in the negotiations of this, this, this convention on climate change? Because what we have seen here today, this morning has been these three uh, very, uh, in, we benefit from these innovative cases uh, in which uh, organic agriculture has, has a role to play and the approaches to climate change are really evident there. But uh, how is this going to be reflected in uh, the practical approaches to the implementation of the SDGs? It, it depends on the, um, on the uh, uh, national and regional structures and negotiations that are going to, uh, and dynamics, uh, situations that uh, the different countries and regions have uh, uh, and how they will see and, and, and uh, um, face these sustainable development goals. The sustainable development goals, at the same time, they will have targets. So what uh, it could be um, a, a good w approach is to have, um, make sure that some of the targets that these sustainable development goals have contain the issues of land and soil. For example, I know that uh, uh, target 15.3 is uh, the achievement of land degradation neutrality, which is like land degradation prevention. And uh, the same with in food security and the financial structures of food uh, uh, that, uh, that accompany um, the assurance of, uh, of, of a secure world with uh, regarding uh, food and, and feed. So um, this, uh, this issue of, uh, of uh, political negotiation, financial um, aspects, also include what the presenters mentioned, the how to increase social capital, how to increase livelihoods, how to increase governance at the local level, how to interact between the, the, the small-scale farming and the large-scale operations in a, within the same ecoregion or within the same country. These are the issues that uh, perhaps we should bring to the table and at the core of the negotiations, not only of this Convention on Climate Change, but also the Convention on Desertification and the Convention on Biodiversity, as well as to highlight it in, the, in, the, in New York. How we can do this? We can, as I said, provide a message like the, uh, in events like this, but also talk individually to the negotiators and highlight this is important and this is a priority for the majority of the countries, even, even Germany, even Australia, even India, this, all these countries are based, have a, a substantive base on, on agricultural production, and how is it that we can tap and harness that, that issue? So this is what I, I take uh, home with the, from this event, but thank you for asking. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, all the panelists. And thank you, all the audience, uh, for, for being here. I know that we have to 
close the session. The lunch is waiting for us. There's still a lot of questions. I see a lot of hands rising. So, but you already uh, know his faces. You can approach them uh, during the breaks or during the lunch or during the coffees and ask uh, the, the questions uh, more specifically. Uh, thank you all. I think we deserve an applause.